Sunday. Oh, praise the Lord. Kids, you can be dismissed to Kids Way Worship. You can meet your leader in the back. And before I introduce our guest preacher for this morning, uh, let's do our memory verse. It's the last Sunday of the month. We usually review it the first and last. So let's say our memory verse together. It's in the, on the screen. It's in your bulletin. It's in your Bible. And Lord willing, it's in your heart. So let's say the reference, the verse, and the reference together. Hosea 2.23b, I have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. Hosea 2.23b. Our guest preacher this morning is a pastor and church planter in South Florida at the church Grace Upon Grace. He originally is from Bogota, Colombia but is serving the Lord in Florida now with his wonderful wife, Gabby, and his two children, Priscilla and Sebastian. Uh, clarify, he's not a pastoral candidate for our Spanish service yet. Wait. <laughs> Wait, surprise. No. But my, my dear brother here has uh, written a, a book on discipleship, and he's going to be leading our Spanish people through that in a seminar this afternoon. So we wanted to, to have him come and also preach and give me a week here to receive as well. Because this brother, as you know, your pastor needs people to pastor him too, okay? During my accident this summer, get a phone call from my brother, pastoring me, ministering to me, praying for me, reminding me of the good things of the Lord. So I want to let you know that this man has pastored me, and I'm excited for him to bring God's Word today. So, Pastor Michael Galliano, would you come and bring God's Word for us, and would you welcome him this morning? Thank you. Well, good morning. I am super excited to be here with you. And so, as we were singing, I was just trying to look around, actually more this section right here, and, and just praising the Lord for this opportunity. As I was praying and singing, I wanted God to remind me that we were singing, but then there are situations in life, different situations. And one of the hardest things for me is to preach to our church that I don't know. So I want to be able, by God's power and his love towards his church, us, to really be ministered by his word. So I want you to pray for me to be clear. At all, and also I want to pray for you. To be ready to engage with God's word. So with that in mind, will you come and pray with me as I pray for us? So let's pray. Father, what a great privilege we have. Oh Lord, we do this every week. And yet as I will try to do and remind your people, as I was reminded, that what we do it's just not something simple. We don't do this because we do it out of like a routine. Father, we are gathering because of you and by you and for you. So, Father, I pray that this morning you will come and visit us with your grace. You will come and minister to our hearts. And, Father, that you will help us to have ears to hear a mind fully to be engaged, and also, Lord, a heart ready to respond in obedience to you, Father. So will you come and please bless our time together and, and help us to give you all the glory because we want our joy and our good in you, Father. So thank you for this morning. Thank you for living hope. Thank you for Pastor David and his family and all the elders and pastors here. What a great blessing it is for my family and I to be here. So we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So thank you again for having us this weekend. It will be really a joy being with Pastor David and his family and Andrew and his family as well. It's been really amazing. Uh, I, was, I was not sure that I was a candidate, but I'm happy to be one. Um, <laughs> really enjoying the time. I understand the, the, the amazing hospitality and all this, just kidding. It's been so amazing really to be here with you guys, just enjoying this place, getting to know Wilmer. It's been great. And so before I start, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of information about who I am and kind of give you a story so you can connect it to what I'm preaching today. So like Pastor David said, I'm from Colombia. I'm from Bogota. 
And my dad came um, to the United States in 2000. So he came in, we stayed at home with my, with my mom and my two brothers. And then two years after, two years and a half, um, he brought us to the United States. And I remember I was so excited. I mean, 2002, I came from Colombia. I was 14 years old. And I was so excited to see my dad. Actually, I was happy two years and a half not seeing him. I was really thankful that I would, I would have the opportunity to see him again. But I was also excited to be in this country. I was like, man, I can just imagine being in the United States. You hear things, you watch movies. And it was so amazing opportunity that I have to come to this country. But then in the first years or so of my time in the United States, um, everything was new. I mean, the food was new. Language was new, uh, people were new, traditions were new, the school was new, the weather was new. I mean, coming from uh, Colombia, Bogota, which is all, pretty much the whole year uh, long, it was 40s, 60s, it was a perfect weather. Uh, coming to Miami or South Florida, extends like extreme heat uh, all year long, hot. And I was like, this is not what I was expecting. I was expecting snow, but I guess what? In Miami, there's no snow. Okay, something's wrong with this state. And so everything was new. And all of those things actually made me think, I am not from here. I mean, things are different from what I come from. I'm not from this country. Uh, the food is not my food. The language is not my language. Uh, the people is not my people. So somehow I feel like I didn't belong here. This was not my people. But then now, 21 years living in the United States, I consider this beautiful country my country somehow. I consider its people my people. And then by God's grace, in this country, I met my, love, my awesome, beautiful wife, Gabby. She's from Guatemala. She um, came to the United States when she was 13 years old. And so we met here. But then also in this beautiful country, um, our children were born. I mean, Priscilla was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As our time there in school in Bethlehem. So it was four years living in Minneapolis. And then our son, Sebastian, was born in Florida. So we consider this country now our country. Before it was not our country. Now it's our country. Now we, our children are here. They were born here. We own a house in this country. So I'm thankful to call this country my country when it was not my country at one point. Now, this is not a sermon about... United States. <laughs> this is not a sermon about American or English language and all the beautiful things you have in this country. So what about if I told you something, that we're sharing something much, much, much greater than just being in the same country. What we learn from this passage is that we are now called the people of God. And perhaps what I really want you to understand and what I've really been praying for you and for me is that this notion, this idea of being the people of God, perhaps for some of us, it, we're just so used to, to that. It's like it's snow for you. <laughs> Nothing. Not a big deal. It's March and you're like, come on, just go on, be gone. So I don't want you just to assume that being the people of God is just something normal. I mean, perhaps what I'm praying for you this morning is something that happened to my son as he came to Minnesota at this time. I mean, it was his first time since no. So he was so excited from the plane, looking down and, look, 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 these white spots, white spots, look, look, snow, snow. And so he came out, and, and the first thing that he did was actually try to touch the snow. And then he said, oh, it's like, it's like ice. The concept that he had in his mind was eyes. So he kind of said, it's no eyes. But for him, it was new, still new for him. He's so excited. And my daughter as well. They're so excited to play outside. It's something new for them. They're excited about being the snow. Well, sometimes we just get used to being this. Just normal thing on Sunday. You wake up, grab your coffee, take your car, drive here. And we're just used to, to being the people of God. We're just used to singing praises to the Lord. We're just used to sitting down, someone is going to come and preach, and that's it. This is what we do. But actually, I'm praying that the Lord will help us to understand that our destiny prior to Christ, coming to Christ, was hell. 
We were not his people. He was not my God as a Colombian. And he was not your God as an American. But by God's grace, we have this awesome God. You can call him Father. And that was not the case for you before. I can call him Father. And that was not my case before. We are family in this place. Yes, I look different. I speak differently. But actually what unites us is not this country or my country. It's not our language, even though we're speaking the same language. It's God. So what I'm praying is that we can actually see that what truly gives us meaning, purpose, and obedience is knowing that now by mercy we belong to the merciful God. And that because of Christ, we have this amazing gift of salvation. And not only that, but you are indwelled by God's presence, by the Spirit of God. So with that, the text that we read this morning, um, there's two things I want to share with you in light of this text. Now we have vessels of mercy uh, called from Gentile, that's most of us, if not all of us. But also there is vessels of mercy called from Israel. So Paul actually divides these verses in two parts. He's going to give us the ground for saying, this is crazy. God is the God of Gentiles. That's crazy for the Jews. Are you kidding me? Don't say such a thing. But yes, and we're going to try to see in this text. So first thing we're going to look at it is vessels of mercy called for Gentiles. That's, we're going to be spending our time from verses 24 to 26 in this First point. So, vessels of mercy called from Gentiles. So, let me make sure um, from the very beginning to start in the same place in order to make sense of what I will be explaining this morning. You have saw uh, last Sunday um, that the potter that Paul has in mind is not just any potter. I mean, he's talking about God as the awesome, holy, just, sovereign, glorious, merciful potter. And this potter makes everything with a purpose. Our God makes everything for a purpose, including those vessels of wrath that by grace you're not one of those if you believe in Christ and if you repent of your sins. But every single vessel, whether it be a vessel of wrath or a vessel of mercy, serve a greater purpose, which is giving God all glory and all honor. So our potter, God as the potter, makes everything with a purpose, including those vessels who are for discernible use and for honorable use. So this awesome potter made us for honorable use. And both of these, the vessel of wrath and vessel of mercy, serve as a picture of God's glorious name. As a picture of people praising him, giving him glory. Yet by God's grace, vessel of mercy, that's us, if we have repented of our sins. As vessels of mercy, we should scream or cry out or pray and praise God because as vessels of mercy, we get to call him Father. As vessels of mercy, we know and say things like, you have created me to know the riches of your glory. Now and forever, you were created by God's grace and saved by God's grace in Christ so now you can praise him now and the forever. Instead of being God against you, he's for you. Amen. And don't, go, just don't get used to that idea because, again, it is by God's grace. So these vessels are not, vessels of mercy, are not primarily made in Israel or in a Gentile country. These vessels of mercy, they, they come from those countries, let's say from the Gentile world and from Israel. But those vessels of mercy were created in eternity by the eternal God. And why I'm saying that is because actually in verse 24, Paul says, even us whom he has called. And as you're going through the book of Romans, you know that the call is not just any type of call or calling. He has in mind a salvific calling. He has called you. It's not just, hey, Michael, come here. And that's it. No, Michael, I have created you for me. And I have created you so that you know that by God's grace you are a vessel of mercy. So come and worship me. Come and believe in me. Come and repent. So Paul says that we are called. And called, again, means this eternal salvation to this vessel of mercy that are not just from the Jews but also from the Gentiles. But as you, as you are going through the book of Romans, you know that this is not something new. 
I mean, as you are paying attention to what Pastor Dave is preaching, you know that this type of language of God of the Jews and God of the Gentiles is not new in chapter 9. He's been talking that from the very beginning. But as it's a long book in a long series, perhaps you have to be reminded that Paul is not saying something out of like the blue. He's saying this because he has a context prior to this. And he's reminding Jews and Gentiles by grace, saying, you Gentile, you're part of this story. And the Jews were like, no way. They're not part of the story. Yeah, you Jew, don't be proud of yourself thinking that you belong to Israel. When in reality, not all of you belong to Israel. So he's kind of giving the audience the idea of Gentiles who feel like you're so far apart. By God's grace, you be part of God's people. And you Jew who think you're inside, just be reminded that you might not be inside after all. So that's what he's saying the whole letter. He's been preaching the gospel with such an urgency to call out those vessels of mercy created in eternity from the Gentile world and from the Israel, calling them from the very beginning because this is what he says in the beginning of chapter 1. And I'm just going to read it. Don't go there. But it says, the gospel of God. We're not talking about the letter of Paul. We're talking about the gospel of God revealed in the letter to the Romans. Paul says this is the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. So the gospel of God concerning his son. That's how he started chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. But then later he says Paul's ministry had the purpose to bring about the obedience of faith. For the sake of his name among all the nations. That's what he says in chapter 1 verse 5. So Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation to the Jews only. No. To everyone who believes. To the Jew first and to the, Gen to the Greek also. Chapter 1 verse 16. So Paul knows that God shows no partiality. He saved those whom he wants to save, whether it be from the Jews and from the Gentiles. That's what he says in chapter 2, verse 11. So at the heart of Paul's letter to the Romans, he has a passion. And he's been proclaiming with such a passion that in, in spite of Israel's faithlessness, God is still faithful. In spite of Israel's disobedience, God is, God is still faithful to his promise that he made in eternity to bring about salvation for his people. That's what he's trying to do in the whole letter that Paul is trying to proclaim with passion that Israel's faithlessness is never an argument for God's unfaithfulness. Israel's faithlessness is the opposite. In the contrary, what Israel's faithlessness demonstrates is that the only hope for Jews and Gentiles comes from God's faithfulness. So we're not putting a trust in ourselves or in our uh, lineage or where we come from, whether we be Jew or Gentile. Our trust in, is not in that. Right. Our trust and our hope is actually in that God save sinners who repent and believe, whether they are Jews or Gentile, chapter 3, verse 3. Therefore, Paul says something wild. Are you ready for this? He says that God is the God of Jews. Well, that's not wild. They were used to do that. Yeah, God is the God of the Jews. But he doesn't finish there. He keeps saying, and God of the Gentiles. That's chapter 3, verse 29. Can you imagine Jews hearing this for the first time? Oh, well, not for the first time, but at least for like, they were missing the whole, the whole scriptures. He is the God of the Gentiles, not just the God of the Jews. And Paul is reminding them of this reality. Not only that, but later he will say, in fact, I'm going to go a little bit more to, to something you already know. Your father Abraham, guess what? It's not just your father. Abraham is the father as well of the Gentiles. Because God promised to bless the seed of Abraham. So Abraham was not just the father of the Jews, but the father of those who like him, believe in God, apart from works of the flesh. Thus, he says, Gentiles are also God, Abraham's children. And he says, the father of Nations. That's what he says in chapter 4, verse 12, 16 to 17, and verse 20 to 21. So, all of that to say that it seems to me that it's very clear that Paul is saying that justification is by faith alone in Christ alone. And whether you are Jew or Gentile, you must put your trust in Christ alone. 
not where you're coming from, but your faith is in the person and work of Christ. And so justification, it's an act of God, a miracle of God that happens in your heart by God's grace and mercy. So I think what Paul is trying to say, not only chapter 9, but through all his letter, is that if you want to understand Paul's message clearly, you have to start seeing the new Israel. And the new Israel is not the old Israel. The new Israel, in light of Paul's message, is this people of God, namely the church of God. Composed of Jews and Gentiles. Paul is trying to argue from the very beginning in chapter 5, actually, he says that we are justified in Christ by the promise of God. So I do believe that the us and the we, not only here in chapter 9 that Paul says, even us, he's talking about the new Israel. Even us, and he's able to connect something crazy and wild as us, Jews, us, Gentiles. Not two people, not two different uh, church or people, one people, one church composed of Jews and Gentiles. So that's why in chapter 9, with confidence, he says that we are called vessels of mercy and not vessels of wrath. So Paul is arguing that the vessels of mercy are more than just a people from one nation. The vessels of mercy that you saw last week are vessels of mercy from all the nations, including Israel. So he's saying, for example, hey, listen, Jews, I am one, as I'm working as an example to you that God is still faithful to his promises. Why? Because I am a Jew and God saved me. But also, I'm going to teach you something. God is also faithful to his promises to be the father and the God of nations because they're Gentiles repenting of their, of their sin and coming to believe in Christ. So Paul includes the Gentile in the us in verse 24. Again, because in Paul's mind, God is creating a new Israel and the church of Christ is the new people of God. Now, that might sound as amazing or crazy for some. That Paul does something amazing as well. I mean, instead of being probably criticized as, Paul, you're actually nuts. You're crazy. Something is happening to you. He uses the scripture to support this interpretation. He actually grounds his argument of us, new Israel, Gentiles, and Israel. And what he does, he goes back to scripture. I mean, what we call the old T or the Old Testament. Because they didn't have the new T or the New Testament. (laughs) So he goes back to the prophet Hosea. And in the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, he quotes chapter 2, verse 23, and chapter 1, verse 10. But just let me remind you of something. The prophet Hosea, he was more than a preacher in the sense of preaching something. He lived the message. And the prophet Hosea was the prophet that God told him, go and marry a prostitute. And have children with them, with her. And it was a picture of what God actually did with Israel. They are faithlessness. They are not. They are unfaithful. But I'm still remain faithful. I'm going to give you children. And I'm going to call them not my people. They're not my people. Now, what Paul does here, not only in quoting Hosea to support his view, that usually Hosea, it's a prophet telling the northern tribe of Israel, you are not God's people. Because you are uh, unfaithful to God. But he takes that and he does something amazing. He applies that to the Gentiles as he applies it to us. But I want you to understand this. Because again, it might be so common for you as the snow that you don't get that switch. Or you don't understand the radical change of what it really means to be a Christian. Because Paul, quoting Hosea, says something amazing. He says this, from not my people and not beloved. Just stop right there. Wherever a time in your life that you saw yourself as not people, not beloved. Or perhaps you grew up in a Christian culture, Christian home. That you assume that because you grew up in a Christian culture, Christian home, you were always God's people. But Paul is saying you have to make sure that you understand that at one point you were not a people or God's people. At one point you were not beloved. 
So what we saw in Sunday's class this morning, it was something amazing. I mean, trying to create a culture, a community that we actually disciple one another, a culture that we can sit down at the same table, not knowing each other, and say, this is the thing that I'm struggling with. This is the, the good things that I'm doing. That is going to happen if you understand the miracle of salvation. That's going to happen if we understand that we're not against each other. But that we are for each other. Because God is no longer against us. But he's just for us. The culture of loving one another, having this transparency and really loving one another, it will come as a fruit of being loved by God. So he says this. You were not his people. You were not beloved. But something awesome happens. And he says, now to my beloved people and sons of the living God. Amen. Now you are his beloved people. Yes. That's who you are, Christian. If you have repented of your sins and trust Christ, you are a people. You are the people of God. God is your God. And that's something amazing. So Tom Schreiner says this, a theologian pastor. Paul concedes of Hosea's prophecy as fulfilled in the calling of Gentiles. The church is the renewal Israel and the arena in which God's promises find their fulfillment. This is what we're seeing today. So now in light of that, you have you already discussed some questions in your community groups. So let, let me ask you again these questions. Where do you get your identity from? Where do you get your identity from? Meaning, who gives you value? What or who gives you purpose, meaning? What is the reason you wake up every morning? Or who is the reason that you can go in peace and rest at night? Who gives you the assurance that everything will be okay? Just you and Amiro, Michael, you can be okay. Or really something higher than that and actually not something but someone higher than that. These are crucial questions for you to grow as a Christian. Who gives you value? Who are you looking for to be approved by? Are you resting in the peace that only comes from the true God? These questions are so amazing because, again, you are God's people when you were not his people. So let that sink in your mind and heart, not only today, but after you finish today, at lunch and tomorrow, when you start your job, your day at school, or you think your spring break, I don't know. But wherever you are tomorrow, just remember this idea Pharaoh was not God's people. Pharaoh served a purpose as a vessel of wrath. Pharaoh faced the Lord and the Lord destroyed everything where Pharaoh put his trust in, his meaning and purpose. But now you have God's favor on your side. God is for you, dear beloved Christian. God is for you. He gives you meaning. He gives you purpose. He gives you the, the idea and the passion to wake up every morning and to work and to do whatever you're doing with God in mind and with God giving you his favor and his grace every single day. So now, with that in mind, you have to ask another question. Is this truly, truly true? Is this is actually something that I live for and would be willing to die for? Is really God my God or I just grew up thinking that he's my God when in reality all my affections, all my passion, all my obedience goes to somewhere else and to someone else but God. So in God you have this amazing gift to come to him. So I want to be clear to, to say this to you. You are his people, living hope. Yes. I love your name by the way. You are his people, living hope. And you do have that living hope. As I was thinking about you, I was thinking you should honor that name every single day. Because you walk as, that, as having a living hope, a reality. Living hope for the present time, but living hope for the eternal time or the future. You do have an amazing gift by God's grace to actually walk in light of that reality of being God's people. So marriage in this church should be restored. You perhaps say, well, I've been married for the last 15 years, so we're okay. Well, marriage can be restored. It, would it be one year, five years, 11 years, 20 years? I don't know. But marriages can be restored to find its purpose and meaning in the husband 
you are the son of the living God. Wives, you are the daughter of the living God. And by grace, he has put you together to display to all this city right here, to all these people, that marriage, I was seeing a shirt. Oh, marriage is, yeah. is hard. No, marriage is worth it. Yeah. You should be the one selling people around you. It is worth it to be married. Also, parenting. Parenting should be this idea of intentional discipling our children in light of we are representing our children that we are sons of the living God. And as their parent, we are telling them, look up to God. Put your trust in Christ. Do not settle for the things above on earth, but put your things in the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. So as parents, we're trying to raise up our children in light of God's Word, with God's favor on our side to raise up our children. So where do you look for love? Where do you look for satisfaction, affection, acceptance? And yet there's plenty of places that you can find and try to find love, acceptance, pleasures, and all that. But the question is still to remain the same. Is those places or those people really truly meant for them to be the source of your happiness? The source of your satisfaction, the source of love. Because if it's in God or if it's not according to God, it will be thirsty forever. It will forever be in need of more and more and more. So just remember this, you are his beloved people. You have this awesome God on your side. So whether you're in high school, middle school, college, you have this awesome God who is for you. You're now his people. His awesome God is in you by the spirit of God. So as children of God now, you can live with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And be a thankful Gentile. And a joyful son, daughter of the living God. Now you might say, what about the Jews? All right, we're going to go turn to the Jew now. But Paul is saying in this section of 9 to 11, chapter 9 to 11, this is one of the longest sections about the Gentiles. So he's, he's saying this now, but now he's turning back to the theme of this section, which is the Jews. So now turn with me in verse 27 to 29, after explaining this awesome reality to the Gentiles, he's not just putting aside the Jews. So now Paul in chapter 9, verse 27, he cites Isaiah. He cites Hosea to support his view that Gentiles are included in God's people. But he's not just putting Jews on the side and saying, you know what, forget about you. You're no longer God's people and that's it. No, he's still, remain, he's still teaching that there are some within Israel that belong to God. And that, this is what he's going to turn now into saying in chapter uh, 9, verse 27, when he cites uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 22 to 23. But he says this in light of what he already said in, in verses 9 and 6 and 7. You remember that? Chapter 9, 6 says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So again, in the present context of Paul, few Jews are turning to Christ. Not a lot of them. And so for a lot of Jews, we're like, what's going on? Where is God's promises? Where is our faithful God? Because of what we're seeing right now is a bunch of Gentiles, let's say, coming to Christ and few Jews. So what's going on with God? He's not faithful? Is he just uh, put us aside? And Paul keeps answering, no, no, no. He's still faithful. He's still saving He's still saving those Jews who are professing faith in Christ that are part of the remnant. And so, again, God is saving those who are called to be saved, namely the remnant. This idea that Israel, because it's the nation of God, all of them should be saved, is not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. And Paul is trying to argue from the Bible, from Scripture, saying Israel is not Israel. True Israel is the remnant of Israel. Plus the Gentiles that will come to make these new people, which is called the church. 
So even the great number of Israel, which he cites Isaiah again, when he says, and Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, even that is a testimony of God's faithfulness to the promise of Abraham. Because Abraham, without any offspring, he said, I will make you a father of many nations. And your people, your family is going to be as the sand of the sea. So even the passage is telling about God's faithfulness. But Paul is clear to cite Isaiah in light of this. Only a red man of them will be saved. So he cites that in Isaiah in a context where Israel was in exile. And he says to Isaiah, only a red man will return, will be gathered from the exile. Well, same thing is happening in salvation history. Only those who by God's grace, whether it be Jew or Gentile, they're gathering by God's grace to come to be part of God's family. So therefore, yes, God's faithfulness is displayed in God's faithfulness in keeping the promise to Abraham in making him a father of many people. But in reality, it's also telling about God's faithfulness to bless the seed, the offspring of Abraham, namely the son Jesus with his people. So now in verse 29, uh, in verse 28 actually, he grounds that and says, For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. Meaning he will do what he promised. And let's just be clear that what he promised is not salvation for all Israel. He will exercise, he will, he's going to bring about what he promised. Salvation, salvation for Jews, red men, and for the Gentiles, the number that he wanted to be included in his family. So now in verse 29, he grounds that again and uh, quotes Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9, in this, that, with a conditional clause, which is awesome. What Paul is trying to do here is, if you're thinking that because you're a Jew you can boast of yourself, you have no idea. You cannot boast because you're a Jew. You know why? I'm going to read something to you, he says. And he goes and takes the scroll and probably, or by memory, he cites Isaiah 1, 9. If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, you can include the then, then we will have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Just think about that. Not only has been offended, for the Jews to tell that God is the father of Gentiles. That's already like, now wait. But now he's telling the Jews, you're becoming like the worst thing ever. You might become like Solomon and Gomorrah. But if and only because of God, that his faithfulness in keeping his promises with his people, he is maintaining, he's keeping offspring, he's keeping those who are going to become God's people. But because if it wasn't because of God's mercy and God's grace, all of us, we have turned to be, come like Sodom and Gomorrah. So therefore, the new people of God is the act of God. The new people of God is God's grace and loving Kindness towards us as the people of God. So let me try to close and apply this really quick. If it wasn't because of God, you and I become more worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. So in light of his active work in you, it must be active in your sanctification. Don't let boast yourself or think that because you're a Christian, yeah, you sin. And we minimize our sin. We're not like as worried as that couple or that family or like that person in the news. I'm not like that. In light of God preserving his people, we should take very seriously our sins. Because God is actively working his salvation in us. His plan is to make each one of us as the, as the son. So I don't know if you've been in Christian life 20, 50, 60 years. The idea is that you and I will become more like the Son. So in light of that, God is actively working sanctification in us and obedient that testify of his faithfulness to make sure that we all become like the Son, Jesus. So God will even use our sin to accomplish his plan to kill our pride. But do not assume that even though God can turn your sin into something good out of his grace, let's just sin more. But having that reality of God using our worst 
our sin to make us more like the sun, instead of relaxing ourselves to become more like whatever we want, will make us turn to him in fear of him, in love of him, in reverence of him, and saying, God, I want to be more like you. I want to be more like you. And yet, by God's grace, he will use our sin, consequences of our sin to kill our pride, our independence, our arrogance, our self-righteousness, our indifference, our passivity to our sin, and to do everything that does not bring God glory. Even though he used all of that, we are vessels of mercy. Not to lay our lives into a passivity, but we are vessels of mercy in his hand, be more, more and more in areas of our lives so that we all can become more like him. Why? Well, let me finish with this. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10, because this is what Paul says in that letter to the Corinthians. He says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this, pre- this treasure. What treasure? The gospel. In jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, you have such amazing God, dear family. And my prayer as we close is that you and I will live with the living hope that we have. We have this living hope to be vessels of mercy, walking according to the knowledge that to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. (laughs) Romans chapter 2, verse 7. So let me pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful that by His, by your grace, we are your people and you are our God. We do not deserve that, but by grace and mercy, we're called to be vessels of mercy. So thank you for this, for the gift of salvation. Help us to walk in light of that. Help us to honor you with a life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.